Hello everybody, and welcome back to another Infinite Lagrange tutorial. Today we are continuing our video series on the Angulum server and what it takes to run the Relic Sanctum sites, such as this one here, in order to maximize your profit from coming here. Now as a brief recap, the Angulum server is a special server that you can only get to by purchasing a pass from the in-game store using in-game currency. You can get this pass for a couple different types of currency. You can either get it for the Dawn points seen here, or you can get it for Proxima, the in-game purple currency, which you can either get by in-game means or by purchasing directly from the developers in the form of Chew Coins, which you can see I have a few of. Um, as a reminder, you can either buy an individual pass, which allows you to join a server and get put on a team, or you can buy a team pass and invite up to four other players to join you together. I personally recommend that if you are going to do Angulum that you do team passes with four other individuals and that you each purchase a team pass. The reason for this is because as you can see buying a pass goes on a cooldown. This cooldown is 60 days, two months. Now the Angulum itself only lasts five days. So if you buy an individual pass and everybody else in your team buys an individual pass then you can't go back for 60 days. Conversely, if you buy a team pass, you can't buy another one for 60 days, but your team members can. So you buy one, invite them, and then after that one ends, one of the next persons buys one and invites all of you. Repeat, and now you get five runs every two months instead of only one run every two months. Really, really handy. We could talk about the cluster trade permits, however, I am not going to in this video. Maybe in a future one we'll go over the battleship mod, um, but it's kind of a cash grab in my opinion and not really worth discussing. So, ruins. What are they and how do you get stuff from them? When you go exploring the Angulum server, as you can see here, you will sometimes come across little dust trails in space that look like this. They always move in one direction and eventually they end at a ruin. These ruins come in many different levels going all the way up to level 10. The ruins have rewards inside of them. The standard rewards, which are these ones right here, are more or less useless. They take up a lot of cargo space and you get turned, they get turned in for points. These points in turn uh, reward you with up to 50 Noma points, which can be used to purchase skins and things like that. It's not really relevant for most free to play players. However, you also have a chance of getting a damaged black market tech file. When you go and attack one of the defense posts, in the battle results section, it will tell you how many damage tech files exist within that post. These tech files are pulled from a larger pool that exists within the ruin itself. And once all of the ruin tech files have been claimed, the ruin is empty and that's it. And it will eventually self-destruct. Additionally, sometimes solar radiation will shoot out of one of the system's suns and destroy the ruin. As you can see here, radiation is heading out. If we zoom all the way out, we can actually see the radiation coming out. This radiation is damaging to your fleets, so if you get caught in it, it will destroy your ships quite easily, so be aware of that. Now, to the meat and potatoes of this, these turrets. How do you deal with them? How do you actually harvest them? As you go up from the lower level to the higher level uh, ruins, there are more turrets, and these turrets do more damage and have more health, although it doesn't scale linearly with the level. The turrets also have armor, and much like a city base, 
this armor lowers incoming siege damage if the siege damage is from a physical ship. This is very important, a lot of people do not understand, that while there are three different types of damage, anti-ship, anti-air, and siege, the type of damage done for siege is not just flat damage, it is dependent on the weapon system. So physical for most ships, energy for things like the Taurus, Constantine the Great, and so on. This is important because, if we look here, the fleet that I used had 10 Taurus assault destroyers, 4 aircraft carrier AC-721s, 10 Eris heavy cannons, 7, because I lost a couple, Xeno stingers, and then 8 S9 levies and some cellular defenders and Vetus Bs. Now, one would imagine that the Vetus Bs will do the most damage, and this is the case. They are the heaviest hitting uh, aircraft in the game. And generally speaking, they are one of the strongest ships just overall in the game. But then you would also expect the cellular defenders and the S9 levy to hit really hard. But not quite. So we see here my Eris heavy cannons, which on paper do a significant amount of damage. We will just go ahead and pull up. The stats on them for you. Here we go. On paper, these do 4,700 siege DPM. Oh, you can't quite see that in the video, I think. Maybe you can. Maybe not. Uh, I might need to fix that setting, but we'll do that in a future video. The Eris does 4,700 siege DPM. Here we go. Now you should be able to see it. There. This siege DPM is quite a bit, and it's got a pretty high rate of fire. But its damage per hit isn't all that great. It's only 375, and it's physical damage. Meanwhile, the Taurus has 4,300 siege, which is slightly less than the Eris. However, if we look at it, it does 290 damage per hit, but it's energy damage. So when we go back to our damage report here, we see that the heavy cannon Eris despite having slightly more siege DPM than the Assault Taurus, and despite there being one more of them than the Assault Taurus, did one-tenth of the DPM. That is why energy weapons are king in Angulum. Nothing else even comes close. And we see this borne out by looking at the Vetus Bs, which did 276,000, the Taurus at 154,000, the Xeno Stingers, the frigates, did 60,000, and everything else did very little, except if you look at the Strix. The Strix did 4,200 DPM, and there's only two of them. Meanwhile, if you look at the Cellular Defenders, there are six of these, and they barely did more damage than just the two unupgraded Strix. These have no upgrades on them, or very few upgrades, and they're not even in a carrier. So, fleet comp. Ships that you should focus on. Obviously, energy damage, right? Things like the Taurus Type A and Taurus Type B are fantastic at doing all of the turrets. But, there's a small drawback. If you go to do a turret, see if I have one here that I can show you. I don't. If you go to do a turret, the turret fires back, and much like a outpost or a base, the damage is omnidirectional. It will hit all ships in the fleet uh, randomly, and it prioritizes smaller ships and hits really, really hard. 
So if you're using destroyers like the heavy cannon Eris and the Taurus and things like that, you could expect to lose a lot of ships. We can actually see an example of this in one of my older fights here. I think it's this one. Yeah. So in this fight, I lost a Taurus and I almost lost a couple other ships. And the reason for that was because the asteroids hit me while I was battling. Now, if you're in Angulum, there are the three different types of asteroids that can spawn. You have the biggest ones, which are dense, and then you have the medium-sized ones, which are sparse, and then finally you have scattered. If you are fighting a turret when these asteroids attack your fleet, because they act like ships, like NPCs, when they attack your fleet, your ships do not stop and fight back like they would if you were sieging, say, an outpost and an enemy fleet attacked you. Instead, these asteroids, after 30 seconds, will detonate and do the damage that they would normally do as if you had not fought them at all. It is very important that you do not let this happen too much because your fleet will get destroyed and you will lose cargo space as well as have to replace those ships. So, as you can see, looking at the timers here, these asteroids actually show up kind of regularly. You see 14 hours, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17. That's because they show up give or take every half hour. In fact, if you look right here, I just got attacked by a scattered. This scattered was 34 minutes after the last one hit me. It is a general rule of thumb that within 30 minutes, an asteroid is likely to come attack you. So if you're going to hit a turret, it's very important that you make sure to look and see when the last asteroid hit you. If it was within the last 20 minutes, maybe it was worth it to wait for the asteroid. If, however, an asteroid just hit you 10 minutes or less, it's probably safe to attack the turret. Now, as noted, my fleet contains small ships, destroyers, frigates, things like that. These ships cannot tank the gun. They cannot tank these defense posts. So because of that, you need one member of your team who can field a tanky fleet. Because destroyers and frigates get prioritized and destroyed, even when they're in the back row, you really want to field Cass Auxiliary cruisers. The Cass Auxiliary not only is a larger target and therefore has the same priority as the other larger targets in your fleet, but it is also one of the best repair ships in the entire game. One Cass Auxiliary is easily equal to multiple Ceres, or guardians and can keep your frontline tanky ships alive for a long period of time. To that end, what are the good tanky ships? What should you put into your composition? Through experimentation, I have discovered that one of the best things that you can do as a newer player is to take the good old ST-59. You want to maximize its armor and you want to pick up the HP uh, recovery nodes so that repairs are more effective on it. The ST-59 does very, very poor DPM. However, it doesn't need to do damage. It just needs to tank. You want to have two of these in your fleet if you can. Two of these plus three or four, depending on your tech points, cast auxiliary, is enough to allow your fleet to indefinitely tank the guns on one of these stations. Now, when you get better ships, or if one of the members of your team has better ships, the next step up that I would recommend is the Spear of Uranus. It is a lot slower than the ST-59 and other ships. However, it has a self-healing mod. This guarantees that you do not need to run four Cass Auxiliary and can instead get away with just running three or sometimes even two if you have the correct mods and tech points. 
Additionally, since you are running two of these ships, the damage will be split by the tower between them, so less focus fire, allowing for your heals to be a little more effective. Now, while the turrets will not kill a Spear of Uranus with upgrades and the self-healing mod with two cast auxiliary, it will damage them. They will eventually get low enough where you might have to either repair them with repair tokens in the field or retreat for repairs. This is why I strongly encourage that you run three cast auxiliary at all times, backing two Spear of Uranus or four if you're doing ST-59. Now, if you have someone in your group who can field a fleet like that and defend, then you only need to field damage, siege damage. But siege damage will deal with the turret. However, it does not deal with the asteroids. The asteroids are anti-ship damage. And to my knowledge, through my experimentation, it appears that they also are slightly more susceptible to energy weapons than they are physical. I do not know the stats on them. It hasn't been data mined to my knowledge, but what we do know for sure is the larger ones, the dense, have 50,000 total HP, plus whatever resistance is. The group of four asteroids scattered, or sparse, have 27 or so thousand HP, and then the group of three have only 10,000. The group of three is basically not a threat to any fleet whatsoever. The group of four is likely not a threat to most fleets. Only the dense are really a threat. And that is also because not just that they have more health, the damage dealt if you do not kill an asteroid goes up rapidly with the size of the asteroid. The smaller, scattered, and sparse asteroids are the equivalent of frigates and destroyers. This also affects hit rate, which is the next thing we will cover. These smaller frigate and destroyer-sized asteroids will do a small amount of damage. However, most fleets with destroyers or bigger aren't going to lose even a single ship to them. Now, if you are completely AFK or stuck in battle with a turret, the medium-sized asteroids could destroy a destroyer or two, but that's just based on your luck, so it remains to be seen. Next up, we're going to talk about accuracy, because recently there was a change made to the Angulum server. It was unannounced and not noted in any patch notes that I could find, but it is extremely important. The change has to do with hit rates and evasion on asteroids. And we will just go ahead and show you an example, I think, here. Nope, not here. No, not this one. One of these ones has it, I'm sure. No, because I completed that one. This is why you write a script. <laughs> Yeah, I must not. It must have been in my previous run. Uh, yeah, it must have been in my previous run. So, to make a long story short, the large, dense asteroids are again the size of cruisers or battle cruisers. They may not have that much hit points, but they do have a large hit box or hit radius. So your slower, weaker, or uh, less accurate weapons. Things such as the S9 Levy or large rail guns like on the Spear of Uranus or ST-59 or Thunderbolt will hit them a lot easier. The smaller ones, the sparse and scattered asteroids, however, they're going to struggle. I had a battle report, but I do not have it here. If I remember, I will try to link it in the description of this video, where I was fighting scattered asteroids and the damage dealt by my fleet, my S9 Levies, was like 200. That was it. Meanwhile, the ships that had higher accuracies, such as my Eris, were able to actually dish out some damage. I don't know where that battle report went, unfortunately, 
but it's really, really important to remember that even though these are not actual ships with actual stat blocks that we can see, they do have evasion, they do have a size, and they do have health and presumably resistances, armor or energy shield. Keep this in mind when forming your fleet. So now you have someone to tank and you've put together a fleet. What do you do? Well, as mentioned before, you have to go out and track down these dust trails, and then you have to follow these dust trails all the way until you find their city, their ruins. Dust trails are kind of interesting in this, where you have the fog of war outside of your operation that you can see. However, if you look and zoom in close enough, you can actually follow the dust trail through the fog of war quite a distance beyond what you can see. Whether this is an intended feature or not, I do not know. However, as you can see here, I am able to see almost two and a half operation zones away from where I'm at. Operation zone as in the total radius circle that I can see. So I would then make an operation right around here, and I would travel to that operation. And I would see if the city is here. If it's not here, I would do the same thing, repeat zooming out and going to the next section and go there. Eventually, you will come to a spot in space where the dust just stopped. Like, let's say it was right here. The dust just stopped. That's where the city ruins will be. Now, we're going to come to the next part, the loot itself. All the loot in these sanctums have a size. The size can be found in the battle reports but I'm going to briefly go over it here. This size is really, really important and critical to helping you to farm the maximum number of black market tech boxes. Now the normal junk, I'm going to call it, from the ruins have sizes that range based upon what level the ruin is. So you can see here, this UAV is 8,000, this unknown device is 12,000, and the decrypted data memory is 2,400. This loot came from a level 7 ruin. As a general rule of thumb, you do not want to run ruins that are lower than level 7. This is because the number of boxes that you can get out of such a ruin is a lot less. Meanwhile, if we look here, we have 6, we have seven, and if we go back, we have eight, and I believe we even have one that had 10. No, nope, just eight. Maybe it was on the other account. Also eight, seven, six. Somewhere we have one that had 10, but apparently not here. The higher the level of the ruin, the more boxes you can get in a turret. Additionally, because you are here as a team of five people, it is very important that you work together to hit these turrets. Don't just have one person tank while one other person runs the DPM. Try to get all of your members to show up at the same or nearly the same time. This is because the ruins, even though they have a certain number of boxes in them, these boxes cannot be claimed by one person. It cannot happen. So this one had seven. I could spend the entire duration on this turret and not get all seven. I might get two, three, four if I'm really lucky, but never seven. By putting all the members of your group on the exact same ruins, what will happen is the chance that each of you will get a box will be basically added together. So by the end of those two hours, it's going to be almost guaranteed that you will have claimed every single box. This means that, let's just say hypothetically, your ruin had five boxes, all five of you jump on it, within one hour you each have gotten one box. Well now you know that that turret is empty and you don't need to stay there anymore. You can then move on to attacking a second one like we have done here. You run that one, and once it's out of boxes, you move on to a next one. By the time you complete your third one, it is almost guaranteed that the first one will have finished repairing. 
On that note, we're now going to come to the turret's repair. When you attack a turret, just like when you attack an NPC base in a normal server, it starts a two hour timer. When that two hours ends, it is fully repaired and you have to attack and destroy it again in order to loot it. It's a pretty simple mechanic and a pretty simple timer, but the timer does start from the moment the first person attacks it, so please do keep in mind that sometimes you'll have pirates and griefers who will come in and attack a gun before you're ready in order to reduce the time that you have to actually run on it. It doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. I believe that just about sums up everything that I wanted to go over for the turrets. You now know what ships are good, energy weapons instead of physical. You know that you want to do higher level ruins, level 10 being the best, such as this one here. And you know that it is a very good idea to have your whole team group up on one turret, if at all possible. One small note. The cargo of your ship is where all these items go. If you want to, um, you can manipulate the size of your cargo by picking and choosing certain ships based on the level of ruin that you're planning to go to. The smallest item that a ruin level 10 can drop is 7,400 size. Meanwhile, the boxes, these tech files, are 1,000 in size. This means that if you take your inventory and you divide it by 7,400 or whatever number works for you, you can figure out exactly how many boxes you will be able to fit in your inventory no matter what if the rest of your inventory was filled up with nothing but the junk. This can be particularly useful because what you can do is you can take prefab modules and put them in your inventory in order to fill up excess space like I have done here and ensure that when you go to run the turret, when you collect your boxes and collect your loot, you can have exactly as much cargo as you need in order to fit six, seven, eight, whatever boxes. This will make the time you have to go back to base a lot shorter and makes it so that you can easily collect the maximum number of boxes in a server. For those of you who do not know, the maximum number of boxes that you can get in any given run of Angulum is 30. I have 22 in base right now, and then I have the additional ones in cargo, which I believe said 6 or 7. It is 6. Once I get two more boxes, I cannot bring back any more. Any excess boxes that I have can instead be sold for Noma points, which are then used in the point store. Wrong store. They are instead used in the point store. You just sell them here in order to buy uh, the ship skins and things like that. You buy those skins back in the normal server in the normal uh, store. I have not personally done this because I do not care that much about cosmetics, but some people do care and they want to get their permanent Spear of Uranus skin or, or whatever. I don't care. I have, as you can see, 200 points from four different runs. It costs 2,000. whoop de doo now, once you actually have the boxes themselves, then you can come to the final part, which is opening them and how to get the most loot from the boxes. The simplest way that I can describe this to you is you go to your mail. In the system section, you will have item transferred from Angulum with all of your boxes. You will click claim and they will come here and they will take up the cargo in your research area. You can only store 10 at a time and only 10 will be given to you in any email. However, if you have say 22, 23 or 24 or something like that, you'll have two emails with 10 and one with the remainder. Always make sure you take this into account before claiming the email as you do not want to have a situation where you fill your inventory with boxes 
and then you can't use them all right then because you have something big going like say a big six hour research or something now just like with normal boxes the normal black market boxes you click on it and it will open up in the research branch and you will be presented with a bunch of options unlike a normal box however these options are not going to be all unlocked instead you are given two free points these free points will allow you to open up two nodes now if you'll bear with me for just one moment we are going to go ahead and show you what that looks like So, here we have some of my boxes. These ones I ran a while ago, and we're just gonna go ahead and finish one of them out and show you what it looks like. All right, so you drag the box over just like you normally would, and you are presented with some options. Now, the first two choices are free. So we see here, I take this one, and I take the research point. Those were free. Don't have to spend anything. I just gained one free research point. Arguably, because I bought a battle pass or a pass to go to Anguum, I spent 2,000 Proxima, and I got a research point. But if you can get up to 30 boxes in a run, chances are good that you're going to get 20 to 30 research points or tech points from your Anguum run. And this is in addition to all the blueprints that you might get. However, you've opened these two, but let's say you want to go for the frigate TP. You want another one. Well, we have to take this one. Ooh, that's 200 Proxima. What gives? Well, if we click up here, it will tell you the first and second node are free. The third node costs 200 Proxima. The fourth node where that destroyer tech point is or frigate tech point would be 800 additional Proxima. The fifth node, if there was one, would be 1,500, and then every node after that will be 3,000. It is almost never worth it to do that. The only exception that I can think of is if you were to get a battle cruiser or carrier. Now, I so happen to have gotten a Spear of Eurydice offered to me on my last Angulum run. It would have been on node number five, or no, sorry, node number six, I believe. I didn't have the Proxima to do it and did not feel it was worth it to get the Spear of Uranus, so I ended up actually skipping. Now, let's say that you don't also have Proxima and you don't want to spend it on stuff like this. You've picked your two freebies, you just come down here, click End Research, and that's it. The box goes away. Just like with a normal black market one. If you pick something that has a research time, such as a tech point would, like this right here, would have a one hour time, as you can see here, then you would have to wait one hour before you can actually claim it. Now, I recommend that you only do the freebies. So here you see we have a combat microchip and a frigate tech point on the bottom row, and we have a weapon tech and a research point in the top row. I could take the combat and the frigate tech point, but I don't need the frigate tech point and the combat microchip isn't going to do me any good until I get into a server. However, the weapon tech, while not necessarily useful right this moment, will be handy at some point eventually. The research point will always be handy. 15 research points allows you to get a research box, a ship or airplane or aircraft blueprint. These are guaranteed blueprints or variants of ships that you own. If it is one that you own all the variants or ships of, you can either get five tech points or five research points as a partial refund. This means that if you open up 30 boxes from Anguum, and let's just say as a rule of thumb, 20 of the 30 contain a research point that you can easily get, 
If you do a full set of five with five people rotating, each person spending 2,000 Proxima on a pass, you should walk away with about 100 research points. 100 research points would allow you to get just about seven ship and aircraft blueprints guaranteed. And that is from one rotation of Angulum. If you get duplicates that you don't need, which as we see here, I just did, as I have the Carillion and I am always being given the Carillion, I just simply take the research points and I move on. Now, you may get something different. You may get an aircraft or a variant. I personally do strongly recommend that you take the variants of anything that is below cruiser. If, even if it's a frigate that you will never use, I recommend taking it. If, however, it is a cruiser or above with the recent change to tech points and how you can reallocate them from your ships, I would actually strongly consider taking the tech point option instead of the research points. Five cruiser tech points is easily worth 15 research points, in my opinion. With that, I hope you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave a comment. A like is also appreciated. Or please leave feedback for anything I can do to improve future videos. I do make these semi-irregularly uh, due to my work schedule. This is just a hobby. But I feel it is very important that content like this gets created so that newer players can learn and actually enjoy the game the same way that I have. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time.